Good afternoon, I'm Daryl Jones, Director of Research at Hedgeye. Welcome to our first annual Hedgeye Happy Hour. We're gonna do more of an informal Q&A session. I've already cracked my first beer here, which is a half full bright blonde ale. And actually it's pretty interesting, that bright idea, you know the type, your mind races, your stomach flutters, you feel alive. That's <laughs> <laughs> so a local, local Stamford brewery. Now you can watch that dip down that he has on the show yeah. every morning. <clears throat> so we're gonna, uh, <laughs> okay, we're you know, we're just gonna go through the the. Q, By the way, these guys Q, aren't Q sponsoring uh, the show or anything like this. This is uh, we're happy to to do it with the local guys, and yeah, Jonesy Buds and I drink beers, but um, you got you got you got to crack yours. I, I didn't quite think that they were going to um, like that. Our team was going to do this on a Monday. Like <laughs> you know, I drink every day, but uh, Monday, you know, we'll uh, we'll get right into this. All I right, well, this actually, so I'm going to start with that. <clears throat> Right, well, we'll go straight to alcohol since we're having a beer. <coughs> favorite beer, favorite wine, favorite liquor. Favorite beer, favorite wine, favorite liquor. All right, favorite favorite beer would be Moosehead. Uh, for those of you that don't know that, that's Canadian beer. Favorite wine, varietal or uh, bottle? Uh, I'd say maybe both. If you have. A... I'd say. I mean, I'd, on California cabs, which is what. Half my wine cellars. Uh, I'd go with Cliff Leedy, the Canadian's wine. It's a Stag's yep. Leap vineyard. Yep. Um, I can give the story on that if you want. It's a very, very good wine. And then uh, on the Italian side, Brunello is my favorite you know, varietal. I think I've talked about that a lot. And, yep. and then on the liquor, oh, it's easy. Tito's. Tito's and soda. So I'm going to go, this is a, kind of off the beaten path. My favorite beer is actually Magic Hat number nine, <clears throat> which Jeff Hamilton introduced me years ago. New just, Haven. Yeah, it's kind of a. I think it's a maybe a local Vermont or Connecticut beer. Um, liquor has to be Crown Royal. And then I'm kind of a Pinot Noir guy. Yeah. Kind of like a, a little bit of a lighter red. Nice. All right. So the first one is actually a little investing. Is that why you go a little crazy when I yeah. when I feed you the beast, a little yeah. uh, big cab in the, in yeah. the wine cellar? <laughs> big cab's tough. You've been down there a couple times. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Too many. <clears throat> uh, first one is actually investing related, but I'll ask it since it's the top question. Keith, could you add some context to, to the results of the process for the year? I.e., can you give a ballpark of how you've done in your in your PA, you know, using the tools you've created? Mm, I mean, that's a that's a that could take a while. Because yeah. um, I probably in my a, PA have, on average, something like. Let's say 150 trades a week. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot. Uh, what I think the real, you know, just kind of go it chronologically. The best thing we did this year was make the quad four call at the end of January. So that pivot, I didn't lose any money. I made money throughout the period um, of, you know, really from the February peak to the March low. Uh, then did okay in April, uh, traded all right from the short side. Totally screwed up May and into the first week of June, so that's where I was getting squeezed. I'm um, talking about U.S. stocks, that is. All the while, we were bullish on, on uh, gold, treasuries, so that worked out fine. Uh, then the big pivot that we made after that, I guess on the long side, so the best pivot on the short side was the um, full cycle investing pivot to the quad four and on the negative side. But then on the positive side, I think the most recent one, shorting the dollar in June, buying commodities, buying emerging markets, buying China, et cetera. I think that that was... About as good as you can do. So for me, I was, I was pretty happy with that. <clears throat> okay. So I want to hear DJ's best quintessentially Keith story. And there are a lot of them, a lot of which I can't tell. Um, I think a pretty quintessential <laughs> one. Which one are you going to tell? Pretty quintessential one is uh, we'll, go, we'll go back to college hockey. So I was a year ahead of Keith. Keith was a year behind me. And uh, for whatever, you know, Harvard was sort of our arch rival, but Cornell was always really the battle, right? And you know, and there, there's a great ending to the story. But you know, we'd go up there, we'd get pounded. We'd usually sneak one pat, you know, kind of beat them in in New Haven. I think it was probably my junior year, your sophomore year. They come to New Haven. I think we beat them, right? <clears throat> and but they they were chirping us the entire game. Their coach, in particular, I think was chirping you. Yeah. And so you know, back then pre Schaefer. pre COVID, you shake hands, <laughs> and then we're in the uh, shaking hands after the game, and. Uh, you know, we're going through, and 
Keith shakes the coach's hand, but doesn't doesn't let go of his hand. Because this is Cornell's coach, you know. So like clearly some authority issues even back then. And, uh, <laughs> but next thing you know, it's basically a brawl. With both teams, you know, shake, sh- trying to shake hands. The refs came back on the ice, broke it all up. We got a bit of a stern talking to from our coach in the locker room. He, yeah. He's like, "Boys, you got to respect your school, your families, and the game of hockey." <laughs> But you know, I think we you know we we we, we toasted to that uh, you know at toads afterwards. But. Well, what happened in that game was that we were pounding them. I mean, it was at one point it was nine or ten. Okay, so that was that that, that might have been the, we were, the ten the ten we beat them like ten or eleven one. Yeah, so I was by the like the by the Cornell bench at the at the faceoff dot outside the blue line, and Schaefer was chirping me. Like, because he sent our line out there, and I guess we were on the power play, and and, and he said, oh yeah, you you, you know. McCullough, you see, whatever, blah, 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 blah. and he was chirping Taylor too. So our coach, uh, God rest his soul. But um, so I was chirping him back, and then it's, he just any time I skate by the bench, he chirped me. The coach yeah. is chirping me. I'm like, well, kind of, yeah, like enough. Um, and he's, you know, I'm not going to say what I thought about him at the time, but obviously, uh, by the time we got to the line, you know, and he looked like a little fish out of water with no skates on. That yeah. that wasn't a very good idea. But there's a big there's a big history here because. Um, <clears throat> Like back in the 60s and 70s when Ken Dryden played for Cornell, I don't know if you knew this, but Cornell absolutely pounded Yale, <clears throat> something like 14 nothing or something like that. But they they basically pulled their goalie to run up the score. <clears throat> so all the older alums loved it when we you know, had them down by 10 goals, right? Yeah. They're like, this is finally we're getting the revenge 40 years later. So a lot of history. Well, I, think that, I think that year at Yale, we'd, uh, junior year at Yale, we'd uh, eventually, it might have, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember. But... Um, you know, we, we, we would lose infrequently, suffice to say, at home. Yeah. So best hedge I call and worst hedge I call ever. And uh, it's an interesting one because we have 12, <clears throat> 12 years of history. Um, on stocks? Or on or, yeah, we'll macro? Go, we'll go, I, think, I think probably the best call, which are one of the best calls. We've had some really good stock calls, but, um, well, even this year, I mean, go down the board, Roku, Nautilus, but... You know, Starbucks way back in the day, this is probably 2009, you know, you had it in real-time alerts and I think bought it close to the bottom and, you know, it was in real-time alerts until it was, I think he finally sold it up 400% or something like that. So that that on the stock side, I think, was one of the the big calls. I'd say one of the, you know, better, or, you know, consistently best calls are, you know, it seems like the pivots to quad four. Um, when we kind of really make a strong quad four call, we saw that, I guess, this fall, uh, two years ago. And, you know, that's where, because that's where you can really differentiate yourself when you make that pivot and, you know, your your outperformance is dramatic when yeah. the market sells off. Yeah, when you make money when most people are losing theirs, that's the best. I mean, yeah. so the best call ever of Hedgeye was starting Hedgeye with the bear market crash call in 08. Yeah. But you know, shortly thereafter, going bullish in April of '09 was uh, on U.S. equities. I was so uh, I was much less um, multi-dimensional back then. I mean, I was, I'm pretty disappointed in myself looking back because I could have done a lot better if I would have understood uh, fixed income and FX in particular the way that I do now, or I think I think I do now. And that's um, yeah. So it's not, it's never about just like what's the best call you ever made. I mean, it's like it's like are you still alive? Are yeah. you still in the game? Like a lot of people have gone away over all these years. You know, I've been doing it for, we've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, Hedge Eye's been 13 years old. I mean, a lot of people go away. Yeah. And to me, it's about, and, and you know what I'm going to use next. It's not about the picks. It's not about the call. It's, it's about the process. And that's, um, you know, constantly evolving. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And I know the team is too. And I know a lot of you are because a lot of you have learned a better way. Yeah. Uh, I think the best stock call we ever had, now that you want to get back to that, was our short call on Lynn Energy. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. That by, <coughs> yeah. By, uh, short well, calls also. are you know really hard to make. I mean, particularly in an up market. And Kevin Kaiser made this great short call, and we ha- I'll never forget. Uh, Leon Cooperman, you know, commands us to come into his office, like me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, no, the analyst is going to come see you, and you're going to pay for it. And, and he said, well, I'll pay for it. You know, you're both. If you both come, you both come. So we show up, and Cooperman's like. I like your suits. He kept talking about our suits. And we're like, what's up with the suits? And, and you know, Co- Cooperman's an obnoxious guy. And he um, he's telling us how much, well, we already knew. I mean, in yep. his filings, it was the number one holding for Omega and the number one personal holding that he had. So he felt like he had a lot of conviction. So he basically got the CFO on the phone. 
um, and wanted to tell the CFO to tell us basically whatever. First thing he does, he gets the CFO of Lynn Energy on the phone and he's like, these guys, they got nice suits. They don't look like they're, because they have been told, everybody had been told, him included, that we were some kind of fraudsters, making shit up, shorting the stock, buying puts. Um, and lo and behold, he's got two hockey players. You know, Kaiser was the captain of, of Princeton. He's not exactly an uncompetitive guy. And uh, we just sat there and <laughs> so the CFO wouldn't really say anything. And Kaiser, like literally, if you could undress, like uh, Cooperman had this like old wall banker, has this MLP analyst. He just undressed that guy for an hour straight. Yeah. And then we got in the elevator, Kaiser takes his tie off, and he's like, those guys are so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> the stock went to zero. Yeah. Uh, well, then we and we also had the you know he he uh, wrote into Cooperman wrote into Barons about how there's this you know unscrupulous group of short sellers attacking Lynn Energy and so I I wrote a letter back and basically saying you know it's sort of ironic one of the longest running short sellers on Wall Street is you know calling out short sellers. Yeah, but, it was ridiculous. It was but ridiculous. ultimately, you know, the stock company went bankrupt. Yeah. Um, on the on the worst. I mean, we obviously have, you know, like anybody that is playing in the markets, you know, have a lot of, uh, I guess, injuries from having bad calls. I don't know what the worst would be. I mean, there have been some story stock type shorts that we've gotten, like, you know, I'll just say Tesla because I think that we haven't been wrong on the fundamentals, but the stock has done something completely separate from the fundamentals. I will say Jay sort of took it to the sidelines when, you know, the stock sort of, you know, kind of started going berserk um hey, we've had know. countless bad calls that's yeah. the real answer yeah. i mean if you could see them every day that's the whole point you know there's nowhere to run on that answer you know what's interesting about the answer to that question is that most other people can't answer it yeah because they don't time stamp every position they ever take so and you know, to the extent that people need to see that we're we're good and we're bad i mean that's that's the real part of the game so you can see that you can look it up in real-time alerts and in real-time alerts it's not even a it does do service to what we have now because of course the analysts all their ideas aren't in real-time alerts. They're the ones that I think are the best decisions to act on on a, on a signaling basis. So real-time alerts not a portfolio, obviously, so that's what we think about that. And, you know, the worst calls that I make are the ones where the analyst is saying A and I don't act on it. I mean, that's those. I make a yeah, ton yeah. of those <coughs> well, um, I guess, bad yeah, calls. Almost more like yeah. a missed opportunity. Um, yeah. So this is now the number two question. It's an interesting one. Again, more back to investing, but is there a point markets will care about COVID again, or is it old news? And this is interesting because, you know, obviously if you follow the data, you know, COVID, d despite what you think about it or your political bias, you know, COVID right now is probably as bad as it's ever been in terms of hospitalizations, you know, deaths starting to tick up again. Obviously cases are just off the charts. So it's as bad and probably will get worse as it's ever been, but you know, now we have all the vaccine news. Um, the, you know, the market quote unquote seems to be looking through to when everybody has a vaccine. So, yeah. will it matter again? It you matters know. right now. The only, the only one of the only reasons why the market's going up is because of COVID. Yeah. Like, I hope everybody understands that. I mean, if you didn't have COVID, you wouldn't have vaccines for COVID. So now that you have even more COVID, you have an even higher emphasis on the other side of COVID, which is the vaccines. Once you get to not even March. But when we started making the call last year that COVID was going to accelerate the economic decline, exacerbate leverage and debt problems at the corporate level and on the private side, you know, then the comparisons in base effect speak, which is what we talk about, are going to be as easy as they've ever been. So that, that time and space, as, you know, as Einstein would, would, would articulate, and if you give me another six of these, you know, we'll get right into that. Um, you, know, again, you suck time and space in. And again, people that don't understand that that's a dynamic situation don't understand how to study the surface of volatility. So when you think about it now, people bid up protection ahead of the election, bid up protection, they're buying up protection with COVID cases accelerating, and they're just getting smoked. You know? So at the end of the day, if you didn't have COVID, you wouldn't have this kind of a setup. And that's, you know, ironically enough, that's the answer to the question, at least according to the market. Okay, uh, we're going to, where is this one? Okay. <clears throat> What's the best hockey fight you've seen and the, and the best one, the best you've been in? Um, so I think I, I think I'm, you'll have to tell a story, but I think I know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it the best, best fight you've I been in. I think the one you're <laughs> thinking about is the most embarrassing fight but for somebody there, else. There, some, there, the, I think the guy ended up playing Northeastern and then played in the NHL, right? And didn't he knock your helmet off? What was that guy's name? Dan? Dan uh, McGillis. Dan McGillis, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So where, well, you guys were where? Some rink in Ontario? We were in Hawkesbury, Ontario. 
were Marty St. Louis team. So it was Marty St. Louis team. Um, the Hawks, the Hawksbury Auk. It's a Hawks, but a bunch of French guys. So. Uh, my mom's French first language, so please don't cancel. Uh, so I went in there and I was a rookie and I snowed the goalie. You know, I came in flying in just T Bay style and hard break straight in front of the goalie and gave him a little face wash with the with the um, with the snow. And um, so I get popped like as soon immediately. Back then we're not wearing uh, full shields, and um, my first reaction was like T Bay guy, punch back. And um, that was the last punch I attempted to land uh, because <laughs> he he I I, have, I've, I took a civil beating like n I've been beat up a couple times like lost fights you've seen me in various scenarios um, certainly don't win every one but this one I lost as clean as you could lose a fight I got and they and the, the in Hawkesbury these French guys had this little disco uh, DJ thing up top so they start playing like with a mix Rocky da -da 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 -da, and I was like <laughs> boom boom my Frickin' head, he wouldn't put it down. I will never forget doing that. Like, that was a very bad situation for me. <laughs> I went back, so I was living away from home, a long way from home, felt shame, didn't really tell my friends about it, but I went to school like a raccoon, like two completely blown up eyes. It, somehow he didn't break my nose. I mean, which somehow, I have like, I have a great fighter's nose, because I never break my nose. I lose my teeth, <laughs> I get my face. But that was the worst by far. I was 16, he was 18. He ended up being a pretty good NHL fighter, by the way. He was like 6'2 or 6'3. Yeah, Look him a, up. I mean, he was the guy a monster. He freaking lit me up like a Christmas tree. It was awful. Okay. Um, so we're going to go to one more sort of sports related question. You want to hear the best fight that Jonesy and I have ever been in together? Quickly? Oh, which, which one? So there's a Yale football player who's yappy. Right? Um, <laughs> And I'm not going to confirm or deny that, you know, that Jonesy Buds, you know, was his, his ex-girlfriend thought that Jonesy was attractive. Something along these lines, <laughs> he was upset. Um, and he was upset with us, so he started yapping, yapping, yapping. And then uh, throughout the week, he said, well, you know, we're, we're going to meet up at Toad's and we're going we're, we're to so, fight. Toad's is the kind of main campus bar at Yale. Yeah, so he's, he's looking at me and he's like, he's kind of my size, like height-wise, and he's thinking, and the guy's probably never been in one, one before, so I don't think he really knew what was going to happen here. We walk into Toad's, this guy's waiting for us, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the deed, right? And all of a sudden, we walk up to the guy, and this has been brewing all week. There's like Yale football players, there's us. All of a sudden, right over my shoulder comes this fist. Bang! Right in the guy's face. The guy's down. Right by the bar like that. I'm like, well, that was, that was pretty simple. It was Jonesy. <laughs> <laughs> Jonesy just dropped the guy. Yeah. And there was no fight. All the Because the football guys didn't want to fight. Our guys were kind of like, oh, no, 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 about this. We shouldn't brawl you. Because we liked each other. It was just this one yappy little yeah, so they, Well, then we you know, basically stepped over him. Got our beers. Got the bar. And then, you know, that, I think that was the same night where, you know, obviously we're now celebrating. We just won a fight. So we're la <laughs> Keith and I are the last. <laughs> we're the last two people at the bar, and uh, it's like closing time. And you know, we're like, "Well, we need we need to get one more round." Look at each other. We don't have any money, <laughs> so he, Keith takes off his watch and gives it to the bartender for you know six high end beers. And you know, that, was, that was the end of the night. No there watch, but yeah, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, we. That's 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 okay, clean living there. Yeah. You know, on a ser more serious note, um, <clears throat> what quad was that? Yeah. What what life lessons uh, did you did you learn from playing competitive hockey? I played collegiate golf, and I draw upon the lessons learned daily. And you know, I think this is an interesting question because we both coach. Keith is head coach. I am his, his assistant coach, and I coach my daughter. But you know, Keith in particular is very good with um, coaching these 13, 14 year olds. Some of them twelve even, and you know, really. It's, it's you know less about hockey, more about life in a lot of ways. You know, teaching them to stay focused, plan, improve, and you know I think we did learn a lot of lessons from hockey that have helped us in life. And I think you know being able to pass them on now is very rewarding. But you know, you know how would you think about that? What hockey taught you in terms of running a company and you know, preparing for life? Uh, you know, expect to lose and fail fast and. Climb through adversity, not blame your teammates, stuff like that. There's a lot, really hard thing to build a great team. I mean, over the years, what what hasn't worked at Hedge Eye are people that don't you know adhere to those principles. So we've had some real selfish Wall Street people join the firm, and it just doesn't last very long because they just you know when it, when they see adversity, they do this. Right? When I try to show people a mirror, you know, and that's really something that 
internally, like I always start with, let's let's talk about a solution. Let's analyze like what it is that we did wrong in terms of the process, and how, whether it be how we're dealing with each other, what kind of product we're trying to produce. Like we've had, as as many of you know, many you know screw ups with just the video feed on this on this show. You know, we've had a lot of opportunity to basically look at each other and say, hey, look, can we be better than this? And a lot of people, when they get asked that question, they're not really comfortable in saying that the real, the real problem is staring them in the face. And I think that, like for me, like that's the number one thing I've learned in hockey in particular. There's four, you know, and there's four walls in a dressing room. You all face your teammates all the time. There's an accountability. Um, there's an accountability to that that's different than actually other sports. You know, in, in tennis, for example, which is what you played, or yep. in golf, for that matter. You know, we play both. Um, that's not the, it's not the same thing. So you, it is a unique experience that we had, and I definitely draw on, on all of its lessons, both positive and negative. <clears throat> okay. That's an interesting one. Why do you respond to negative feedback from trolls? Every time I see you <laughs> giving trolls your time and energy, I wish you'd rather continue helping members as you do so well. It, it's sort of interesting because we have a different philosophy on trolls. Part of it is I don't have that many trolls, but I, yeah. I kind of like to just make fun of them, right? Like yeah. kind of... Or, or I like let them take a shot at me and like laugh at it. Or, or sometimes you like to, you know, after a few red wines, pound them a little bit. Well, I think it's good marketing. Uh, one, let's just start with that. <laughs> like, don't forget that on Twitter, I'm not there to be your perfect, stable genius, right? If you need me to be perfect or just Keith, the guy who's helping me, and Jonesy used to say this, he's like, Buds, can you have a little bit more gravitas? <laughs> the answer is, no, like I'm not that. I'm not the gravitas guy. You don't want me to be president of any organization other than my own. You don't want to be, have me in any political discussion with anybody who's full of shit. You don't want to have me in a fight. You don't want to have me in a lot of different places in life. But I can be here, and that's on Twitter. If I have some unaccountable <coughs> donkey boy who is not is is unaware and, and unable to use their real name, and and he is so you know stupid to say something to me that can give me an open net goal. From a marketing perspective, I'm going to bury that all day long, because I have no I have no problems with that. Those are easier goals to score than the God-given talent that I had, because it's actually hard for me to score. I have to work really hard to work to, to get to where I'm at. So if somebody's going to try to be that way, then I like to highlight it. The other big thing about uh, these trolls, not to, that somebody just triggered me on this, but the reality is that we have a lot of people that hate us, like genuinely envy and hate us, because we challenge their livelihood, we challenge their existence in terms of you know their personas. So when you think about that old Wall Street and or its media, like we are a very and have been a very dangerous place for people. So what I want to do when somebody, one of those people under a pseudonym in particular, is going to take a shot at me, I just hit him, hit him right back. Do it again. Do it again. Because <laughs> I do hit back. And that's what our brand should do. So don't confuse that behavior, which has got a lot of my own personal flaws in it. I understand that. You know, there's not there's a reason why one year at Yale led the team in points and penalty minutes. That's hard to do um, because I just am that way, and I'm not going to change that. And Hedge, I never will. Uh, if you want me to be the gravitas guy, you got to probably look for Jonesy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's going a little far, but <laughs> we have some gravitas guys. Some yeah. guys that like really, or well, Neil Howe. Neil Howe, you know, How, Ami Joseph. K these guys K are T, some of the yeah. nicest, like most polite people that just aren't going to do that and that's that's life isn't it yep. you know that's a hockey team we have plenty of people that that we played with that didn't have a lot of penalty minutes that scored a lot of points or super valuable players not every, every just be yourself that's a good i mean not to give everybody personal advice here but yep. now that we're getting into some beer <clears throat> um so this is an interesting one you know partially because i didn't initially see it i didn't see it in its totality but this is uh, Grant from Oklahoma. <clears throat> what was your vision of Hedge Eye when you started, and what is your vision of it today looking forward? And you know, the sort of backstory here is Hedge Eye was actually started by Keith. You know, I don't even know if it was actually blogging back then, but emailing. You know, he got got fired, had made you know uh, good money, just had a son, so he just started doing a morning email, which I I was working at the time, but I would edit in the morning. And sort of started on this concept of a kind of macro blog, and then you know Keith developed the concept or idea for Hedge Eye, and actually you know pitched me, and I you know I had a job at the time, and I didn't quite see it in its fruition. And then for me, I ended up just kind of talking to him about it. back then I was research edge, talking to him about it every day. So then I quit my job and joined Hedge Eye. I joined earlier, I'd have more equity, but you know sometimes we make these decisions. But I think what's most interesting to me is 
there was basically this vision 13 years ago that was you know, drawn out on a whiteboard, and it's basically played out you know, very similar to that, where we start with institutional research because we know that market and we, we, we know we can dis disintermediate it and do things different and better, and then you know, we add on, you know, you know, we make that research accessible to everybody, which nobody does, you know, the high quality research to the masses, and then you know, the third thing was always disintermediating financial media as well, because we thought in some ways that's the most corrupt part of the whole you know, cycle yeah. process in many ways. So you know, in many ways, the initial vision has really played out, and you know, I think the next 12 years, you know, one thing that you'll definitely see is us you know, expanding more inter internationally, which we're working on right now. Um, so you know, kind of taking the hedge eye franchise, if you will, and expanding it globally. Yeah, and um, the manifestation of our media presence is pretty obvious, I think, to a lot of you now. But, um, you know, the principles of Hedgeye were, were always straightforward. You know, what Hedgeye is going to be never quite is. And anything in life is great when it's that way. Like, if you know exactly where you're going in life and you actually end up there, that's great. But as far as I could tell, the only thing that happens that way is a book. You know, so, and a book is already written. So, you know, transparency, accountability, and trust. And a lot of the things that people that may not be like me don't like about the transparency piece, calling people out, YouTubing them, time stamping it, it's all the same thing. It's all the same message. You know, transparency, accountability, are you accountable to what you get right and wrong? Everybody knows everything we get right and wrong. Uh, and do you trust us? That last part, you know, I would have never imagined that you would be in such an untrustworthy America, ever. You know, we have, we have a huge opportunity on that front. You know, talking in numbers instead of narratives, talking in terms of, like I say, in terms of process instead of in parables or whatever people talk in, like they're just full of complete shit because they're so focused on being right with their ideology. And we have this wide open runway on, on just being the source that you can trust. And that to me is, is, is the future of Hedgeye. So again, what you're gonna see is a lot more things like the call, which is, us, can you trust us? Well, listen to our morning meeting. Listen to how we uh, respect each other, work with each other, criticize each other, compliment each other, all that. Listen to it. And then we're going to blow it out so you can watch us all day, every day. And that's going to be, I think that's going to that's going to wreck a lot of people's worlds. That's that's where the trolls are living because they know it's coming. Okay. Um, favorite Leafs, all-time forward. D and goalie and current player. I don't know if you have this uh, all those positions in in your mind, but current player might be the one to start with. Well, the Leafs suck. I mean, you don't want to. I mean, I, I think it's not like I'm going to pick a guy. A, a t a, my favorite Leafs player is Wendell Clark. Yeah. So yeah. rock him, sock him, hockey. He's perfect. Right? I mean, yeah. I, he's perfect. Right? He'll fight you. He'll score goals. He's, he'll kiss you. He'll do everything. Yeah, he's uh, he's great. Yeah. So I, I loved Wendell Clark. Watching him grow up. Yeah. Rick Vive was probably right behind him. But, but oh, yeah, I was a big Daryl Sittler fan. Yeah. And then, well, of course, Lonnie McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good As, story uh, on that. So, yeah, we went, you know, so our, our friend uh, Marty St. Louis got induct inducted in the Hall of Fame, and Lonnie McDonald is the chair <laughs> of the NHL Hall of Fame. And I don't know if, if Marty didn't know his name was Lonnie, or could, maybe it was just his French accent. But anyway, so we're, hang, we're, we're hanging out with Lonnie all weekend and all these other uh, famous NHL players, but. Marty keeps calling <laughs> Lanny Lonnie. So that was kind of the running joke amongst everybody that weekend. So, yeah, yeah it's pretty. Yeah. Well, two French guys were being inducted, Marty Broder and, and Marty yeah. St. Louis. So there's a lot of accents going on. Okay, let's see here. My favorite goalie, by the way, for the, for the Leafs, Felix the Cat Potvin. There's this great goalie that I coached uh, and would love to coach him again. He was a younger kid who made my team here in Connecticut. His name's Zay Ferraro. Write that down. Zay Ferraro. He's from New Canaan, Connecticut. His dad's, dad's a, a fire, or the police chief there. Dad's right? a cop, yeah. Yep. Um, and his, um, this kid was like, he's like a cat. You just, just jump in on pucks, like just. That's, he's like that cat trying to get that light. And, uh, you know, when you, see, when you coach a kid like that, and that's another thing you learn from from sports. You know, not everybody can be Roger Federer, or not everybody can be Felix Potvin. Uh, Felix Potvin, by the way, wasn't, he's not like a perennial NHL All-Star or anything like that, but you know, when, you, when you coach kids, try to find a way to call them something that you respected. And then they'll, they'll look that up, and then and they'll, they'll be, he, I think he likes that nickname. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is... Uh, I think he's one of the best goalies in the country now. Yeah. He's a good little goalie. Mm -hmm. um, and his dad's a great guy. Uh, Caesar from Chicago. Keith Jonesy, I'm a 28-year-old engineer. 
I realize my passion is in financial markets. Is it too late to change careers? Any advice on getting my foot in the door? First of all, at 28, you're very young. <laughs> I'll say that. You know, you can. <laughs> uh, you're certainly not too late to change careers. Um, you know, we st we started Hedgeye when we were in our mid 30s, basically. So you know, we started a company in our mid 30s, and we've started other companies over that time period. Um, 28 is very young to, to do anything. You know, one thing is just to start doing it. You know, we had this guy that we interviewed, I guess it was pre-COVID, but <clears throat> I think he was, he's either an accountant or an insurance, and he just as a hobby started doing research on gold stocks, right? He's a middle-aged guy. Yeah. And he's become this sort of phenom uncovering mining stocks, basically, has this newsletter blog that everybody follows and you know so you know he picked that up midlife just because he had a passion for it so i don't think it's ever too late to change careers shift careers um you know one thing that makes it so easy in this day and age is you can just start putting your ideas and thoughts out there that with the advent of twitter you can get feedback you can learn from people on twitter um to, you know to get your foot in the door um i think you want to try to probably work or intern somewhere that can help you develop a process, but you know I think also writing a lot, studying, reading, yeah. and then figure out what part of the industry you want to be in. But um, okay, what are some of your favorite hockey jersey designs, uh, and why is it the classic Coyotes uniform? Um, <clears throat> well, we like the Coyotes because we used to own part of the team, so we kind of have a soft spot there. But terrible um, uniforms. Yeah, I like the throwback Kachina you know, uniforms. Um, you like that? I actually do, but maybe it's because I spent so much time out there. Um, <clears throat> I think know. that's awful. I guess. Our, our, our buddies, you know, now the president of the Ottawa Senators, and they're bringing back their throwbacks as well. Yeah, former former president of the Coyotes who bought the, the Coyotes with us, Anthony LeBlanc, is the pre president of the Sens now. And Sens, they really, I, I sent, you saw the note I sent them to the other day. Yeah. I mean, it's like... Don't get rid of that Roman helmet. Like you gotta stay with some good stuff. You got some good stuff there. Um, yeah, but they, I think you, you know. To me, I guess I like the kind of classic Calgary Flames. But I grew up out there. But, oh, God, know, man. I don't know. But you got yeah, red and yellow. It's like I, the, I think you, like some teams have gold, but they're yellow. You kind of go like to the they're, they're they're yellow. You, I, you go to the you know I don't know. Some are terrible. Like you know the old uh, Anaheim Ducks jerseys like. I don't know. But you see how like your like our biases are like my I have a visceral reaction. I don't feel like what you want me to feel when I'm telling you to sell more gold today. But I know what gold is and I know what the Calgary Flames like PP yellow is. Like I don't like the Flames. I grew up like that is not something that I agree with Jonesy. But what I would say back the best looking colors are and you're going to have a hard time telling me the same back is Yale or Toronto Maple Leafs blue and white. Yeah, no, that's, they're definitely classic. No doubt about that. See that? See that? Okay. Let's See, he doesn't. He's he, he's got more gravitas. I mean, I got a lot of Calgary Flames people that are not happy with that. And and that and that's saying that I do. Oh, I'm okay with yellow. This is yellow here. The Misbehavior of Markets, my favorite book of all time, next to the Holy Bible, is um, also yellow. It's more yellow belly, like canary yellow. Yep. Um, so, the cover of Diary of a Hedge Fund Manager is yellow. Yep. Um, I don't like Calgary Flames yellow. Okay, it's an interesting question. Do you ever worry about becoming big enough subscriber-wise that your process becomes front-run by the machines? And, you know, we have, you know, at times some of our real-time alerts move pretty quickly. Um, and that's, you know, I think in part because we have a large following. I think macro is very, very different. I mean, you would have to be so significant to move macro markets in the short term anyway mm -hmm. um, but you know what are your thoughts on that and I don't worry about that at all I yeah. think that that's a question I've had that question so many times I've never like of all the things I could worry about during the day if, if I have to worry about that first of all it's a high class problem um, I think it's more important to, to worry about like can you keep finding ways to win and most importantly can you keep finding ways not to lose when everybody else does that's the key you know, because hedge eye, what it does today, is what matters, not what people, how many people follow it. That's not that's not going to have the impact. You know, to be able to front run big moves, you know, big Federal Reserve moves, up or down, big market moves, macro up or down, big stock moves up. If it moves a lot the first time that we hit the button on BMRG, for example, like B Riley, uh, the SPAC company that's going to now be called EOS. Fine, look at what it's done since. I mean, it's not. 
it's either the idea is either going to be right or it's going to be wrong. It has nothing to do with whether or not hedge I hit the button one day or not. So I, I don't worry about that at all. Okay. Um, let's see here. Thanks for the compliment. Oh, okay. That is Actually, a compliment. I mean, yeah. you know. Okay, it's an interesting one. It's a nice compliment. We're going back to investing a little bit. Um, is this a macro tourism market? And are the macro tourists the smart money right now? Or you know, maybe start by saying, you know, by describing what you mean by macro tourists. A macro tourist is somebody who wakes up in the morning, uh, reads talking points, headline news, and jumps from talking point to talking point. That is not what a uh, Navy SEAL does or uh, a commander of the skies, you know, in an Army battalion or you know, whatever you're talking about on the ground from an Army perspective. You know, that's, you have a process. You wake up and nobody can really see what you're doing, but you're preparing to do something. So there's a big difference between being a tourist jumping from headline to headline and, you know, really understanding from time series to time series what you're trying to do in a macro market or in a company's P&L in terms of what we call the micro quads, for example. So there's a, th there's a huge difference between those two things. Yeah. Um, what was the question <coughs> above beyond? Is this a macro tourist market? Like, are yeah. They well, are they the smart money? Let's, to be clear, whoever made the most money today is the smart money. Right? Now, the thing about the, the tourists is that they can feel smart for short periods of time and then lose the most amount of money or all the money a significant amount of the time. So I wouldn't take a short term, like particularly a moment like this from COVID until where we are at the all time highs and say, okay, well that makes that the smart money um, forever. But it certainly did make it the money making money for the period of time that mattered. Now it did make it the money in everything. We, we can you know, obviously get people there. You know, if you bought airline stocks in June, you, wrote, you had to wear those losses all the way up until when we basically got the most recent uh, move higher. But you're really just trying to get back to break even. So again, is that the smart money? No. You know, the smart money is who bought Japan. You know, it's making the highest level since 1990, 1991. Uh, who bought uh, Taiwan, which is making a new high today? You know, higher highs. Those are that's the real smart money. Who made the turn in commodities as an asset class? I think that's a really smart, smart money. Uh, you know, the people that are tourists in nature are generally stock people, so they miss like the whole, basically everything that's going on away from just the stocks. And yeah. that's an interesting thing to watch too. All right, best liquid lunch story from your years on the, the old wall or since you started Hedgeye. Um, I think I can po point to one recently that I thought was pretty interesting. You know, we had a, we're partnered on, well, you know, partnered <laughs> on, we're, we're partnered with a gentleman that runs a hedge fund exclusively on um, Hedgeye's research. And we were- He's just launched it. So if you want, just launched if it, If you yeah. want details and you're a credit investor, he's- yeah. Um, <clears throat> reach out to us. But anyway, so we were pitching to basically all the largest unions in New York City. So you have the firemen, you know, the whatever, the plumbers, the X, Y, Z. But we have a room of, you know, it's me, Keith, Darius, maybe somebody else from Hedge I Todd. And we come in with our, you know, 100 page slide decks. It's a lunch at this kind of old school steakhouse that supposedly has mafia ties in New York. So it's this classic setup. You have all these union guys who are very blue collar came up through the ranks and you know, we get there at like 12 30. i don't think we left the room till like five after consuming and you know the 20 like middle-aged or a lot of the older than middle-aged guys just falling out of this room and, and i think we talked about the economy for about 20 minutes and it's just wine after wine but you know it's sort of uh i think classic what happens a lot of times where you know for a lot of these guys you know the you know, they're trying to educate themselves, but it turn, just turns into this complete booze fest. That, you know, <laughs> you know like we're, we're falling over each other. You know, oh, it's a, boy. But, yeah. oh, boy. But I don't think those, yeah, I, I think Wall Street, you know, to, you know, back when we started, there was a lot of entertaining, schmoozing. Wall Street's different now. It's more kind of quantitative, more nerdy. You know, I think you get a little less of the boondoggles. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd rather... Particularly with some people on Wall Street, there's no like you don't want to hang out with them. It's like boring. It's nothing like just go hang out with your friends. You don't have to do uh, some of the best boondoggles are just with your own team. You know where you can just let loose. You know it's a tough it's a tough job that we have. You know when you when you start grinding at the hours that we do, uh, and then you know by the end of the week you can be pretty mentally exhausted. Yeah. 
notwithstanding all the you know upkeep we have to do with all of you and answer all the questions, that's a super important thing to us because we want to be transparent and accountable to you. Uh, but I, I've seen some real benders at Hedgeye <laughs> in terms of our team. Oh well, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> We've had some here, uh, which we won't get into at the moment. But yeah. usually, uh, usually the Christmas party, holiday party, to yeah. be politically correct. Don't cancel. Come on, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm Catholic. I do, I do call it Christmas. All right. So we know Keith has Irish roots. Do you know which part of Ireland? Also, Jonesy buds, <coughs> Welsh roots, surely. So I don't know. Do you know what part of Ireland? Uh, my dad and I are constantly arguing uh, about this. Yeah. The more of these we have when we get into this argument, the less we get to the, you know, the less close we get to the answer. Um, so you know. There, there's a significant amount of, I'm trying to teach my dad this, there's a sig significant standard error in the assumptions that Irish people make, you know, relative to who they, <laughs> who they really are and where they came from. So again, let's just, please, let's just leave it at that. Yeah, so I actually did 23andMe. I don't know, have you done that before? No. It's, no. <laughs> so I, I thought it was awesome because, um, so I am, I, I am part Welsh and, you know, actually my mom's family is all Danish. So I sort of knew that going in, but then what you realize is you're a lot more than you ever thought. And then I'm actually, you know, something like 0.5% Sierra Leone, <laughs> whatever that. That's so nice. somewhere way back in my family, I you know, have some, I guess, African roots as well. Uh, okay, hold on here. Really? See, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, this is Jonesy interesting. Jonesy is Sierra Leone. Yeah, 0.3%. I guess it, now that you say that, I could tell. Thanks uh, for making hedge fund research available to the small guy. What's the backstory in hiring Darius Dale? <laughs> this is actually interesting because Darius was uh, I think a 2009 grad. Mm, eight. Or eight, sorry. So, you know, the, the, the SHIT was hitting the fan. And, you know, we back then hired Let me Google that. Let's see if he's that famous now. When was Darius Dale graduated? Let's see if that's already been Googled. <clears throat> but, thing. So he, you know, at that point we had started the company in New Haven because we thought we could really leverage resources from Yale, which which we did pretty effectively. And Darius's resume was sent to us, and <clears throat> right, right, right away his resume jumped out at me because oh, he graduated in '09. Oh no, yeah, I thought he was '09. So, but that would have been kind of just coming out of the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It but, says here on Google, Mr. Dale, Dale joined the first. <laughs> you just, I just, we just asked Google. Yeah. How amazing is that? He. And he is joined after graduate college in 2009 and is a two-time recipient of the firm's Employee of the Year Award. Yeah, there That's you go. Great, there you go. But so, you know, his resume jumped out at me right away because not having talked to him or known him, but, you know, he, he showed, like, dramatic improvement throughout college. You know, his, you know, he had great grades, but they might have went from, like, a 3-0, but by the end, he was basically at a 4-0. So Keith was actually pretty similar in that regard, but you could see. But I went from like a 2-0 to yeah. a 3-3. There was <laughs> a different. But he, would, you know, Darius was continually improving. You know, football was his big extracurricular. Same thing in football. He kept getting better and better and more accolades. So to me, I liked that right away. We brought him in, and he actually started as a executive assistant <laughs> for Brian McGough on the retail team. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then uh, I think yeah, that's uh, a long time ago. Keith and I. Late one night, got this impassioned email from Darius that his, uh, I think his passion was macro and he wanted to join the macro team and all that. So then he eventually moved over the macro team and, you know, really has been a big driver of, uh, you know, quant you know, quantifying a lot of what we do, instilling a lot of the models and process and, you know, obviously servicing a lot of clients. But yeah, you know, I think, you know, just like his resume suggested coming into Hedgeye, you know, his improvement over the time at Hedgeye has, you know, seen a similar trajectory. Yeah, I think that that's a super, um, like, for, particularly for those of you that are younger looking for, I don't, I'm not going to give everybody career advice or whatever, uh, but if you just look at the path of successful people like that, Darius, it looks like, I just learned this, uh, started uh, Yale football in 06, and uh, by 08 he was first team all Ivy, right? So that's, your trajectory is like that. You know, same thing at Hedgeye. The guy, like, I think he did math, but not the kind of math we do now. And he taught himself, literally taught himself. I watched him teach himself. Um, he didn't ask, you know, for me to walk his dog because he didn't have one. He didn't ask me to hold his hand at night because I wasn't going to call him at night. And um, look what he's done. It's amazing. He, I would put him head to head with any of these, I mean, actually not even, it's not even worth it. It's not even the same league. Put him against like an old wall econ, they don't even model it stochastically. So like why you, you'd have to put him against somebody on the buy side that does what he does. All right, we're coming in on 45 minutes, so I think we're gonna wrap it up. But before we do, we gotta do a little JMO. 
Really? The people are asking. The people are asking. My hands might be too... Uh, if you can grab that, my hands are too slippery. What are they asking? They, just, they want us to wrap it up with a little quick shot of JMO. Really? I don't think we can take all this. Hey, uh, hey Maxi, see how strong my hands are? <laughs> yeah, powerful. All right, cheers, and uh, cheers to Hedge Eye Nation. Thank you very much for tuning in today, and thank you for supporting us through the years. We appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Salute.